Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of our book club author chat. This month, uh, we're reading the book Machine Learning Q and AI, and we're super honored to have the book author Sebastian joining us today to discuss the book. Uh, yeah, welcome, Sebastian. <laughs> yeah, uh, hi, everyone, and thanks for the kind invitation. Um, actually, yeah, I'm super flattered that you chose my book for the book club. So um, yeah, that's uh, actually super exciting. Um, I really appreciate it. And yeah, I'm happy to chat more about it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we actually voted for the book. So every month we have like 10, 11 books for us to vote. And everyone oh. wanted to read your book. So oh, I'm glad to hear. <laughs> Very <laughs> flattering. <laughs> That's actually really nice to hear. It makes me, yeah, really glad to hear. Because, you know, writing a book is a lot of work. And, um, yeah, it's it's just nice to hear. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So uh, I know our book club members have a lot of questions posted oh, on Discord. Okay. Mm -hmm. Before we dive into the specific questions, I was wondering if you mm -hmm. could kindly introduce yourself and maybe give our audience an overview of the book just for, mm -hmm. for viewers who have not read the book yet. <laughs> Yeah, um, so my name is Sebastian. Um, I was an assistant professor of statistics at UW-Madison, uh, University of Wisconsin um, for, yeah, I would say four or five years, and um, which I liked a lot. It is just like, um, you know, it's academia is one thing and I've been uh, in academia for a long time. I was a PhD student before and I thought it's time to explore, you know, startup life. <laughs> so I joined a startup, a Lightning AI about two years ago where I'm working on uh, yeah, deep learning related um, contents, uh, mostly yeah, the, like deep learning research, education. Um, if you heard of PyTorch Lightning, that's a framework we are developing, for example, open source framework. But yeah, lately, um, I would say for the last year or this year, I've been really focused on large language models like yeah, everyone, but it is, you know, it's a lot of fun because you um, get to code um, things from scratch and um, there's a lot of stuff to explore there. So that's, yeah, in a nutshell, what I'm usually working on during the day. And then uh, with this book, so uh, I've written a few books before, um, Python Machine Learning and Machine Learning with PyTorch and Scikit-Learn. And I like writing books a lot. Um, so it's uh, one of my passion projects or my yeah, uh, favorite, let's say, free time activity almost. Um, and with this book, you know, like writing a book is um, a lot of work and it's a lot of fun. But uh, for this one, I thought, let me try something new. Um, so because on I'm probably more active than I should be on social media, uh, I always share a lot of like contents regarding, I don't know, things that I find interesting. So usually I just like to share what I like to read. So it's maybe a bit selfish, but if I get excited about something, I like to share it. And um, so with this book, I essentially extended upon some topics I discussed, let's say, back then it was called a tweet, back in a tweet. Uh, it's now a chapter, a longer chapter. And what I liked about this, um, I mean, this was just a crazy idea. Let's write a book, a and a book, like questions and answers. But then, um, yeah, I noticed I wanted to sh like actually uh, write about my flashcards because I often on social media talked about my flashcards in Enki, where I read a paper or learn about a concept and I ask a question to myself that I in a few weeks will answer so to just remember what I learned. And uh, when I was writing this book, uh, I noticed that these answers became more like chapters. Um, so yeah, and that is how I wrote the book. I just picked topics I found interesting and that didn't quite fit, let's say, into my lectures or into my previous books. Like, um, let's say self-supervised learning. It's a really interesting topic. I actually, in my recent class, I have a short lecture on it, but there are other topics where, okay, this is interesting and important, but the semester is only so long and you have to make uh, choices or let's say you have to cut content to make it fit into a semester because um, you can't cover it all. And here I thought, okay, for someone who has already read an introductory book or already took a machine learning class, what's the next thing to learn about? So you could, in a sense, dive into a specific topic. If you are interested in computer vision, you can write a whole book on, let's say, just convolutional networks, and then maybe vision transformers could be even two separate books. And then maybe one on uh, classification with vision transformers and one on, let's say, um, generating images like vision transformers with diffusion models or something like that. Like um, that could be almost like a whole book if you want to explain it step by step. But then, yeah, you miss out a lot of other things on a lot of other things. And with this book, I 
didn't do this approach where I chose one particular topic. I instead covered 30 different topics. Um, so 30 topics I found interesting and I thought are worthwhile knowing about and talking about. And yeah, so I collected 30 topics I found interesting. I have actually more than that. Um, I had probably 100 and then I was just trimming it down <laughs> to make it fit into a book, right? I mean, otherwise this book would, I mean, this could be potentially a um, second volume at some point. Um, so I picked questions uh, and, and wrote the answers that were interesting um, to me. And I hope <laughs> others find them interesting as well. And um, yeah, the title is called, it's called Machine Learning Q and AI. Um, it's interesting because I wanted to have the word machine learning in there because, you know, AI is a buzzword. And in a sense, if, I, if it's like something AI, people would think it's, you know, link chain something. Uh, and at the same time, I, I feel like machine learning conveys that it is more, you know, like, the fundamental concept behind uh, the, the learning algorithms. But then I also wanted to have AI in the title because there are a lot of LLM related topics. And I also talk a bit here and about, about diffusions models here and there. Um, and long story short, when I had the first draft that was or started, that was in December when ChatGPT came out. Um, it, it, so I, you probably won't see it right now in this version of the book that you have downloaded. But in the beginning, um, it was basically me versus ChatGPT, where I was writing a chapter, and then I asked the same question, like the chapter question, to ChatGPT and included the ChatGPT answer, uh, which was not uh, I, okay. I don't want to brag here, but it was not as good, I would say. I mean, this was uh, ChatGPT 3.5, and the main reason was, um, yeah, I think it didn't go so much into depth, but then also one shortcoming of these AI models is they made mistakes. So there were a couple of mistakes um, and I had also discussions on those and it can't do figures. And I think figures are very important. Um, so I made sure that at least each uh, chapter has at least one or two or more figures because I think with figures, it's really, yeah, like it's a cliche, but it's uh, worth a million words almost, right? Um, so, and this is something where I feel like um, this is really valuable. And yeah, this was basically my yeah, vision for this book, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Having some, yeah, explaining concepts in a way that I hope um, makes sense and it's clear, but it's also not overwhelming. I wanted to keep it short so that, I don't know, if you uh, have five minutes uh, waiting for something for the next meeting to start or 10 minutes, you can read a chapter basically, or uh, it's not like you don't, you don't have to sit down for three hours and, you know, dive deep in. It's, some, it's more like in, in smaller chunks. That was also my goal. And it helped also with the writing. So I could do about like one chapter per weekend, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. I have to say, I am a big fan of this book. It's probably oh. one of my favorite ML books so far. Oh. And I look forward to read your second book if, if you decide to write yep. another it book. Sounds here. like there will be a volume two then if it's so well received. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I definitely appreciate the high level understanding of our different questions uh, and also like details of the questions. Um, okay, so um, I have a lot of questions as well, but I would like to open the floor to our book club members for any questions they may have. So please feel free to unmute yourself and ask any questions or post your questions in the chat or simply introduce yourself in the chat if you would like. I'll go ahead and jump in. So um, my name is Matt Pitlick. I'm a data scientist based out of St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and Sebastian, I have to say, I think you're a, a fantastic technical writer. I followed you on Twitter and LinkedIn for a number of years. And so when I saw you wrote a book, I bought it immediately and I, I really enjoyed it. So um, I also have a bunch of questions. I'll throw one out right now though. So in, in the very beginning, in your first, your first question, you talk about embeddings and how typically um, you use one of the last embeddings, well, one of the last layers in a neural network for embeddings, mm -hmm. uh, but any layer can be used. Are there, when when would you use one of the earlier layers in a neural network for embeddings? That's a good question. Um, maybe that's also a nice addition to the chapter itself if it comes up. Um, yeah, and uh, thanks for the question, Matt. This is actually um, something I would say, it really depends on the data set and the task um, you're trying to solve. So I would say the more, so the earlier layers, they are more from general to specific. 
And um, so when you are training, let's say you, I do that all the time for benchmarking when you uh, train, let's say an image classifier or a large language model for classification, even though let's say you have a vision transformer or a convolutional network that has the same number of classes as you have in your target data set in the context of transfer learning, for example, um, it makes sense to chop off that last layer and replace it. Even if you have the same number of classes, you don't technically have to do it because the last layer is very specific to that specific data set and the specific classes. And if you have slightly different classes, it won't work as well. And I think I would say most of the time, it's probably enough to replace the last layer um, and see how that performs. Uh, but I think if the data set is more different from what you're working with, if you are maybe classifying birds and then you want to do something with medical images, which is um, very different, let's say, or let's say an animal ob or an object detector and then some medical imaging related content that is maybe from x-rays, which is very different, um, the images look very different, then I think it might make sense to consider some of the earlier layers. But I would say it's not it's not clear when I would say usually you get a lot of performance already by just replacing the last layer and then just fine tuning the other layers. So personally, I would just replace the last layer and consider first fine tuning the other layers. I notice sometimes it also makes sense to just add more layers instead of, you know, taking away, you just add more layers to the end. Um, yeah. And there's, for example, the inception net architecture, uh, an interesting experiment. So they are two loss functions. They have an um, auxiliary loss in the middle and uh, the loss regularly like that you have usually at the end, uh, like a cross entropy loss. And they consider both losses. That was, I think, InceptionNet came out like a year before ResNet, like, I don't know, 2014, 2015. And they had that loss in the middle of the network to make sure the earlier layers learn well. And it would be interesting to see how much different is this um, loss in the middle from the loss at the end for different scenarios and different data sets when you do the transferring there would be maybe some way to measure it like you know like how good are the earlier layers but yeah long story short i would say often it's not necessary but i you know i just included it you can use the earlier layers because you know technically you can but i'm not sure if it's always worthwhile yeah based on my experience but yeah my experience is also not the most comprehensive one yeah yeah, thank you. That's that's interesting. I've never heard of just adding layers without removing any. Um, I think I'm I think I'm going to try that. That's really interesting. Yeah. So I think that uh, I noticed that, for example, even if you take like a distilled bird model for like text classification, so you can replace the last layer, but you can also add like two or three fully connected layers at the end. It's basically replacing the last linear layer with a small multi-layer perceptron. It's not always um, necessary, but I notice sometimes it can be useful. The alternative would be essentially training or fine tuning more of the earlier layers. I did an analysis. Um, I have an article somewhere where, where I did that, where I uh, froze the whole network and then I um, unfroze the layers uh, starting from the back. And yeah, it's not necessary to even train the earlier layers. It's really a thing you, or the transformer blocks essentially. So I think like training the last one and then training the last transformer block, that is a huge difference. But when you go further to the beginning, it's it's taking longer uh, to train because you have more parameters to train, but you don't get more, let's say, predictive performance. So it's like diminishing returns almost, I would say. Cool, thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> awesome. We have a question from the chat. Uh, wanted to ask for an example of the lottery ticket hypothesis in NLP. Mm, I would say um, an example of the lottery. Uh, yeah, I would say it's um, for distilling models, essentially, for finding smaller models. There are, I mean, other strategies like, um, I mean, just like weight pruning strategies. Uh, in, in the lottery hypothesis, they also yeah, do a pruning, essentially, of weights. So essentially, um, finding a smaller subnetwork that has the same performance as the original network uh, when it's retrained from scratch. Um, I think that is usually, uh, I don't, I would have to double check, but uh, maybe another good um, point here is to add in a specific example. I would have to check into, let's say we just talked about Distillbird, I have to check into Distillbird again 
how exactly they pruned the model, but that could be a potential example where you have a large model like BERT and you want to come up with a more, let's say, efficient, smaller model that has a, approximately the same performance. And yeah, no one really knows for sure, but there are also these rumors that um, GPT-4 became smaller or more efficient, which is maybe also an uh, application or inspired by the lottery hypothesis where you are pruning the network and keep the performance. Of course, there are um, rumors that the performance is worse, but yeah, that would be an example where, let's say the lottery hypothesis inspires people to look for smaller networks after the fact that you demonstrate it performs well. So first, the first stage is always like, yeah, let's get the best predictive performance or modeling performance, the best outputs. And then let's see, see if we can make it cheaper, basically. Right. I, uh, I find it interesting when you mentioned in the book, there's no way to find the winning ticket without training the original network, which is like more expensive. Yeah. You have to mm -hmm. cost a lot more to make it more cost efficient. I think that's, mm -hmm. that was interesting. That is a, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. In, in a way it's like, yeah, you have actually more work, <laughs> right? But then, you know, if, um, if you then deploy it in practice and you have a lot of customers like you know uh, gpt or gpt4 then it's probably worthwhile at some point yeah but yeah. right <laughs> another question uh question eight the keys to success of transformers you mentioned large numbers of parameters my question is what is the effect of laura and qlora in this um yeah, so LoRa, uh, so the uh, QLoRa would be a quantized uh, version of LoRa in a sense. Um, quantizing essentially like converting, um, yeah, like the float precision to uh, integers, basically uh, um, lower bit integers to save memory, and uh, essentially both both uh, methods. Or let's say LoRa for simplicity is about saving parameters so there's this idea that if you train a network a large neural network or like a transformer um, the matrices are um, yeah relatively large but these foundation models they perform well on many different types of tasks um, like you can ask it to do language translation you can ask it to do um, summarization and generating poems and um, writing emails and all kinds of things. And even some math, you know, they are like uh, more like generalists. And if you want to fine tune a model for a specific task, in that context, these weights might be overkill. Like you don't need such large weights if you, let's say, just want to adopt this model for translation. Then you don't need all the knowledge for, let's say, doing math or doing maybe even um, summarization or writing poems if you only care about translation into one specific language even, for example. And LoRa is about, in a way, then um, taking advantage of this by decomposing the large um, matrix into a matrix multiplication with two smaller matrices. Like instead of having a 10 by 10 matrix, you have a 10 by two and two by 10 matrix essentially. And um, yeah, and that is how you save parameters. And implicitly what it does, it's also not learning the weights. It's learning, let's say, if you would fine tune this network on a new data set for a specific task, during the training, you get these um, delta, uh, these changes, the delta weights, like how you would update the model with gradient descent. and you are basically with LoRa approximating that. So you're approximating how the weights would change compared to the foundation model. And what's nice is, so if you are someone who developed, um, let's say GPT-4, and then you have customers who want a specific application of that model, you can fine tune this model differently for each customer, but you don't have to save this large GPT-4 model every time. You only have to change um, the the weight changes so you you have the original weights and you have the delta weights and then you add them together to have the new model but you in practice you, the foundation model is the same for all the customers and the delta weights these are different but these are now smaller matrices due to the um, factorization uh, if that makes sense so it's in a way 
um, specializing or fine tuning a network, a new network in a parameter efficient way, instead of updating all the model weights and saving that huge model each time, you save smaller versions of that. And um, it's also, if you think of PCA, it's in a way like PCA or uh, factories or SVD, uh, so, so singular vector decomposition. It's like the same, same concept where you are um, throwing away information uh, by focusing only on the most relevant uh, information. And yeah, and that is in a nutshell, one technique to adapt or adopt large language models for target tasks. So yeah, and uh, we have this, uh, I just wanted to mention because I played around with that a bit. We have this lit GPT repository, um, which is like a repository, uh, open source repository where you can load different language models. And um, yeah, I ported the LoRa into that framework from Llama, uh, which was a lit Llama, which was another open source repository for uh, yeah, large language models. And I ran some experiments and when I remember correctly for the off the top of my head now, uh, the 7 billion Falcon model, like uh, 7 billion parameters, fine tuning it on the alpaca data set, which had 50,000 data points, uh, was about one, one hour on one A100, for example, for reference. And for the full fine tuning, I needed eight GPUs for that, like, and it took a day or eight hours or something. I think the reason, though, I have to be honest, why it was so slow is because I needed so much memory and I needed to do um, CPU offloading, which meant I had to copy uh, parameters from the GPU to the CPU, which takes a lot of time. But the, the bottom line was essentially LoRa allowed you to only use one GPU instead of eight GPUs for the fine tuning, which is very nice. So I yeah. have a, a related question on Discord. People asked mm -hmm. earlier. Like um, in question 18, I think, when you mentioned uh, uh, different various parameter efficient fine tuning methods, mm -hmm. um, but only LoRa and QLoRa are kind of popular right now. Um, mm -hmm. So why do people not using other methods you mentioned in the book? And why do you think LoRa is mm -hmm. so popular? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. I wonder the same thing. Um, I think QLoRa is very really nice because it's also uh, it's newer and it has the quantized um, quantized um, stuff on top of it. But like just in general, LoRa was already very popular, and I think um, that is because it's just a very elegant method. Um, like the way you factorize the matrices is, is very elegant, and I think it's. I wouldn't. I don't actually know if it's more efficient um, than the other ones. Because I also, so um, Adrian, a colleague of mine, he implemented um, adapters, Llama adapters, and I also added uh, Llama adapters version 2, which is a small change. And these performed in my experiments similar to LoRa um, in terms of it took like a, an hour on this Falcon 7 billion model. So I wouldn't say. Laura was better, but in a way, I like the idea. It's more elegant. Ad, um, so adapters are essentially inserting layers in the network. So it's, I mean, it's also still elegant, but you kind of like need almost more code changes because you have to kind of like insert something into the network. Whereas with uh, Laura, you have you only the the delta W that you keep and then you add it, um, like not even concatenate, just adding it. And I think it's just like a very, very intuitive and elegant solution, which is what people like, whereas the other methods, I think they need more surgery in terms of changing the transformer blocks. Um, I would say, though, um, I'm not 100% sure about that, but um, I mean, at least I haven't seen that yet. One limitation of LoRa is that um, all the methods I've seen so far are for text, where with Llama Adapter, the authors, uh, Llama Adapter and Llama Adapter version 2, they also had multimodal inputs so essentially um inserting image tokens into the text so you can take an existing text model and then make it also work um or yeah, you can fine-tune it also on multimodal data that has let's say images it could also be sound or something but i think they specifically focused on images and that would be i would say one advantage but if you don't care about images i think laura is a really nice intuitive approach and also one last thing it's called llama adapter um, but it is uh, essentially it works for all neural networks it's not specific to llama i think the name comes just for the fact from the fact that 
Llama was just very popular when that method um, came out. So they took advantage of that and called that method on the paper Llama adapter. Yeah. Um, is there a repo for a Llama adapter or a la adapter? Do you have like examples mm -hmm. that we can um, look? I can maybe quickly uh, look at this um, or see if I can find it. So um, there is an original repo, but uh, yeah, we also have that in this lit. Um, GPT repository, which mm -hmm. has multiple methods, which makes it then easy to compare. Um, I will just post the link here. It's an open source repository. I'm not sure if you can see that. I posted it in a Q&A here. Oh, uh, maybe that was not the correct one. Oh, I should have posted it in the chat. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Yeah, and there are... No, okay, still I got much. it. <laughs> oh, you got it. Okay. Um, yeah, and there is a subfolder. It's uh, called fine tune, and there are yeah three different methods. But there should also be. Um, I remember adding the references to the paper to the readme. There should also be an, the link to the original repo sometime or uh, somewhere. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Um, so what I'm pasting right now, that would be the original Llama adapter. And it's also a Llama adapter version two, which is very similar. I think uh, the difference, there were only two differences, making the bias trainable, and I think making the RMS norm layers trainable. It was a very slight difference. The paper was very different because they focused more on the multimodal stuff, but um, the architecture is very similar. Awesome, awesome. Yep. We have another QLaura question, and then we'll go back to um, someone else's question about the book. Uh, you said in a tweet before the GPU will be open source. What do you think it now after QLaura? Uh, GPT or uh, if GPT will be open source or? Um... I don't I don't quite understand this question. Uh, yeah, Hashem, if you would like to elaborate on what do you mean? Okay, while well, we're waiting for, okay, question 20, evaluating. Okay, that's another question. Let's come, okay. we'll come back to uh, this question. How long do you think this book will stand the test of time knowing that mm -hmm. in the large language model land, that means a week or even daily basis, perhaps the high level approach deal with that, but it doesn't, doesn't, yeah, yeah. So how long do you think it will stand? <laughs> um, so in this book, I think I had, i um, just looking at the overview of the uh, table of contents. There are six yeah, chapters on LLMs. So I think um, looking at those, they are pretty uh, so general, like I would say, these foundations won't change. The only thing is there might be uh, newer things that can be added at some point um, in a potential second edition or something. But I think like all the concepts um, like data augmentation for text, um, distribu distributional hypothesis, uh, these fine tuning methods, they, they don't change. The, I mean, the methods will be still the same or the concept of encoder and decoder style transformers. But we will maybe see more things like where I mentioned the fine tuning methods I had a list of different methods that I explained. There might be a new method um, in like, you know, a year that is different from LoRa or adapters. And so that could be a potential to add something, but I wouldn't say it fundamentally changes. Now there are um, interesting developments in the large language model realm though. So we have uh, the method RWKV, which is like a recurrent uh, model, a recurrent uh, large language model. And there is Hyena, uh, which is a convolutional large language model. So these are maybe things that could be mentioned there one day. I would say they are relatively new. So they seem to perform well, but um, I'm not sure if they will take over, um, if they will be pursued. So it's just interesting to keep an eye on that. But I think the world is pretty much still focused on um, transformer based large language models. So I, I think these um, concepts, they, I would say, still form the foundation. But at some point, yeah, maybe there could be additional new things that could be added. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of the concepts are 
pretty good. It will last forever. <laughs> um, I, I have a question, I guess I'll go ahead and ask. Um, so in chapter seven, or I guess question seven, you talk about multi-GPU training paradigms. Mm -hmm. I think the model parallelism, data parallelism is kind of mm -hmm. easy to understand, mm -hmm. but some of the other concepts like tensor parallelism, pipeline mm -hmm. parallelism, sequence parallelism are more challenging to understand. Mm -hmm. And I'm not actually sure how they are used in, uh, in practice and implemented in practice. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about those concepts. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so let's do sequence parallelism first because it's, um, I would say, an exotic one. It's specifically for large language models. And I included it because I saw a paper on that like a year ago or two years ago. But I must say, I have not seen it being used in practice. And when I recall correctly from reading that paper and uh, writing that chapter, which is also a few months back, it's essentially just splitting the sequence into smaller subsequences and then uh, distributing these um, tokens across different GPUs. And then in the attention mechanism, there is a communication between the GPUs. So it's basically the same as the attention mechanism that you would do in one GPU, is, uh, except that you split the sequence. Um, so you have maybe the first part of the text on one GPU and the second part of the text on the second GPU. And then the self-attention mechanism has some communication where it communicates across the GPUs. Um, I mean, going a step back. Um, so data parallelism is essentially splitting the data across the batch dimension. So if you have a batch size of eight and you have two GPUs, you would give each GPU four um, yeah, examples. So you split um, the batch. And that is the reason for that is um, because yeah, you have, let's say, a problem where you can't use larger batch sizes. So you can take advantage of multiple GPUs. Each of the GPUs runs a smaller batch size, but then you um, do that in parallel and then you average the gradients. So and it allows you, it's not exactly the same as running on a large batch size, but it's approximating that. And this could be speeding up your training. I noticed in practice, it is, of course, speeding up your training. You iterate through an epoch faster because you have now, let's say, two GPUs or more working in parallel. But um, I noticed sometimes you need more epochs um, then or to converge to the same loss. But it is um, substantially, let's say, speeding up your process if you have multiple GPUs. Um, the other thing is, so that is data parallelism. But sometimes you can't even run a batch size of one on a GPU because the model is just too large. And in that case, you can use um, tensor parallelism, which is, uh, so tensor parallelism um, is the strategy where you split up the matrix multiplication or the, the weight, essentially you're sharding the weight layers, which means you are, um, let's say, cutting the weights into two smaller matrices. And then you do the multiplication separately on the separate, uh, separate GPUs, and you can essentially concatenate the results. So it's a way of fitting a model which is otherwise too large on onto GPUs. Um, it's different from model parallelism. So model parallelism is more like um, if you have 10 layers, you would put the first five layers on one GPU and the second five layers on the second GPU. But for this, the second GPU would have to wait for the first GPU because it's like a, a sequence. And pipeline parallelism is somewhere in between that. Some a pipeline parallelism is, um, reducing this bottleneck there's some trick where some things get uh, recomputed during the backward pass i think so there's less idle time between the gpus but it is also i think not very popular anymore in my opinion so the most popular strategies nowadays are um like deep speed stage two and three and um fully sharded data parallelism in pytorch it's i think fully sharded data parallelism is a re-implementation of deep speed stage two which combines both um data parallelism and tens tensor parallelism so you get the data parallelism where you are splitting the uh, mini batches across different gpus but then you're also splitting the um, layers um so taking advantage also of that so it's like a combination of the two and i would say 
that's currently the most relevant one. Uh, you can basically always use that. And uh, yeah, sequence parallelism is a special case that I have not seen really implemented in a popular framework yet. It's more like, I would say, a research concept. And pipeline parallelism, I think, is um, more like, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know if there is some pipeline parallelism in fully sharded data parallelism. I may be wrong, but I don't think so. Um, so I think it's maybe not super yeah, uh, relevant anymore compared to tensor sharding, because I think that was really motivated by the large models that they don't fit onto GPUs anymore. That's really and, helpful. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> oh, one more little thing I wanted to say is if you use fully sharded data parallelism, it will automatically determine which layers to shard based on a number of parameters. I forgot the number. It might have been, I, you would have to look in the source code, but by default, I think it's something like 11 million or something like that. If the layer is smaller than 11 million, it would not do anything. Then you would just get regular data parallelism, for example. Yeah, sorry, um, that was my answer then. <laughs> Didn't but want that's to. That's like yeah. uh, we actually don't need to manually write it. It's a PyTorch uh, module, basically. Yeah, so PyTorch has an implementation of that, um, and I honestly, uh, it is very nice. It's like building blocks. If you think about um, Matplotlib and then Seaborn or something, where uh, or maybe even NumPy and Scikit-Learn, I would I would say um, PyTorch is here more than NumPy where yeah it is all there the building blocks but it is um still you know you have to write a lot of boilerplate code to implement data parallelism like ddp uh, distributed data parallelism or uh, fully sharded data parallelism so yeah i don't want to advertise this but we have this open source library called fabric where um you basically make four you change four lines of code and then you can just implement or so you can say uh, strategy equals FSDP and it will do it automatically. Otherwise, it's honestly, it's really um, maybe 30 lines of code where you have to restructure your training loop. Otherwise, you have to initiate initiate a um, process group and then uh, yeah, spawn. Uh, you have the MP spawn, the multiprocessing spawning sub processes, and then you have to make sure the everything works uh, and then gets destroyed at the end and you free up the resources. It is, you know, it is easy, but it is not trivial. It's, I think on a PyTorch uh, YouTube channel, they have like a playlist of like, I don't know, five or six videos, like 10 minute videos to show you how to implement that for the basic case. And then there are special cases. So I think it's important that it is in there. Uh, but yeah, in Fabric, we just to make it a bit more user friendly, we have a wrapper around that. So I think yeah, this is an important building block. But then in practice, I would say it's still not trivial. But yeah, you know, with Fabric, it makes it a bit easier to use in practice. Yeah, because you know personally, before I used Fabric, I just sometimes because of laziness, I just trained one model per GPU because it was just easy. I didn't want to bother with um, doing distributed data parallelism uh, because it was just always oh, I have to restructure my code now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I learned Fabric during your sci-fi tutorial. It's oh, yeah, yeah. Really nice. Oh, yeah, I remember. It was not too long ago, like two weeks. I saw you in the audience. Yeah, thanks for yeah. attending. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was awesome. Uh, we have several questions in the chat. Uh, why don't people unmute yourself and just ask directly? I feel like you can have more context. Ask questions directly. Or if, if anyone else have questions, feel free to, to ask. Don't be shy. <laughs> Yeah, can I, can I ask a question? This is Sergey. Uh, hi, Sergey. Yeah, of course. Please go ahead. Uh, just a quick question. I, I'm in, in digital health and um, uh, just your very general opinion, like nothing technical, uh, but when you have a very specific data set and let's say it's just text and you want to apply one of those large language models, um, but you, know, you want to fine tune it, like how do you in your view, go about it? Do you use like some of this new techniques like QLora, um, you know, human feedback? How do you go about sort of in general incorporating, let's say a brand new data set you have specific, let's say for hospital or like medical practice in my case, um, just your general thoughts. Uh, I have never worked with medical data uh, in that sense. So I, yeah, um, I, 
It's hard. To, it's a good question. It's hard to make a general recommendation, but I would say um, it depends also a bit on the task. Um, if it's more like a general uh, model, like you know, like GPT-4, but trained on medical data, or if it's a very specific um, use case, like um, answering or maybe classification or something that is uh, more specific, where you know, like when. Um, in medical context, maybe yeah, you maybe want a model that does a, a certain thing, like a, reads some medical notes, and it's just specifically for diagnosing a specific um, subset of diseases instead of being a general um, chatbot, right? So I think that might be more like a case than for um, QLoRa or LoRa, where these methods, I, I think, I mean, the methods after fine tuning, they still have some capabilities as general chatbots, but yeah, you make the assumption you don't need the huge weight. So basically, you only update certain things. So I don't know what it will be a little bit of a, di a different model. And I don't know how good it will still be on the original general tasks. The other case, I remember there was Bloomberg GPT, uh, which is it's not a medical model, but it is a model based on finance data. And what they did is they just pre-trained um, the model from scratch and they mixed the original data with finance data uh, for the pre-training. And honestly, I don't think they did fine tuning after that. It will be an interesting question to, so the question would be, was it necessary to, you know, like pre-train Bloomberg GPT? Could have been, could it, could it have achieved the same performance if they had just fine tuned it, like a, an existing um, GPT like model? And I don't think anyone has done that experiment yet, like comparing pre training on a specific corpus compared to um, fine tuning on a specific corpus. It might be an interesting question. So I, I wish I could give you an answer, but I honestly think that is something empirically to try out and see. <laughs> and of course, if you can share the results, if it's uh, in um, yeah context uh, okay to share, then of course it would be a very interesting insight for the community. I think to see whether which approach is really worthwhile. Yeah. Thank you. Since you mentioned diagnosis, I mean another issue is obviously hallucination. So that's mm -hmm. uh, perhaps another reason. You know, people do things like, you know, human feedback um, mm -hmm. and actual fine tuning itself uh, to maybe try to focus a little bit more of those. So they like the power of the models, obviously, uh, but they want, to, want them, I guess, to be more focused. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm just maybe curious about your opinion in terms of reducing those hallucinations of the original large models. What can we do I, about that? Yeah, I do think it's a good point. And I don't think there is a good solution it sounds frustrating but i don't think there is anyone who has a solution to the hallucination problem otherwise it would be already um i guess um solved by either bart or gpt4 uh, i think it's a problem that no one has a good idea for uh, yeah to solve at the moment um because it's in a sense the nature of the language model if you because you have it generate new things because otherwise yeah it would always generate the same answers right so in a sense it's on i would say it's almost by design that it generates unexpected things or weird things sometime because otherwise yeah it would be just like you know memorizing uh, exactly the training data but yeah i think also there to the point i mentioned previously i don't think there are any convincing experiments regarding um, reinforcement learning with human feedback, the RLHF versus regular supervised um, training in the, in the sense that there are a lot of papers that just say we get the same benchmark scores or performance using supervised um, fine tuning compared to RLHF. I think it's really um, hard to say. I, I think there were like some papers saying that uh, it was about imitation models that the results they look good also in benchmarks or when humans rate them but in a on a, under, if you look a bit closer and do some more extensive analysis these are more like they look good on the surface but the devil is in the detail that these models are not as good uh, in terms of truthfulness compared to um rlhf but at the same time the, the problem is i think there's no direct comparison i, I don't think this exists because um, yeah, for GPT-4, it's just not available, um, the data set that they used to. It's not, I don't think it's possible really to 
to say which one is better without having done a very comprehensive training with both. And I don't think anyone has done that um, because no one had the data for RLHF so far. So there were some experiments, but only on, let's say, very small data or not like really human generated data, more like um, data from another model or something like that. And um, yeah, I, I think it's a good question. I think so far, um, GPT-4 performs very well. I would say whatever they used, RLHF, the way they used it is maybe the gold standard at the moment still. Um, there are other methods that perform equally well, but not quite as well, I would say. So, but it is also expensive, right? It's like, uh, I, I honestly don't know how much time and effort went into that. I think it's, it was probably a solid year at least a large team of people, millions of dollars that went into that. It is not something that can be routinely done, I think. It's it's really like a cutting edge uh, research question. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as frustrating as it sounds like, but this is very difficult, which is why I like, for example, right now, um, there's this uh, one LLM, one GPU, one hour, uh, one day challenge, uh, the NeurIPS challenge, where they ask participants it's like a competition to train an llm but it's only the limitation is you are only allowed to use one gpu you are uh, like a 100 or 4090 you can only train for 24 hours and um what was the other limitation yeah one llm uh one gpu 24 hours which is you know doable for a single person like you don't need to have uh, maybe a billion or million dollar budget and uh, 50 people for that which is refreshing but you know it's probably not going to be the cutting edge model yeah can i ask a question oh yeah sure hi my name is ramya uh, i just graduated with a master's in data science from brown university i've been following your blog your course and now your book, uh, really appreciate your work and looking forward to volume two also, by the way. Uh, my question to you is on XG Boost. Do you think it's still relevant um, these days or are there problems that are better suited with XG Boost over some other deep learning approach? What's your opinion on that? It's a good question. I had a uh, blog post, um, I call it, I think, deep learning for chrono uh, the, a chronology of deep learning for tabular data, where um, I listed all the papers that used um, deep learning for tabular data. I must honestly admit, because there were so many other things I, were, I was doing recently, that I didn't update this like for, I don't know, half a year, and there may be methods, new methods now that are much better. But I, I doubt it. I think XGBoost is still a good baseline. You, you know what I like also about it is that you can just implement that on a tabular data set in like, I don't know, uh, 20 or 30 lines of code maximum, which is really nice. It, you can train it on a CPU, GPU, it works. It's a good baseline. There might be cases specific um, tabular data sets where deep learning methods are better. And I think there are also yes, uh, at least two or three transformer models um, for tabular data. And they could be better on certain cases. Of course, the papers say they are better, but it's, you know, you, you never know because usually when you develop a paper, you spend more time on the method you're developing. And it could be just that, you know, it's just a better uh, tuned method in that sense. You, you just spend more time on it and it just happens that at some point you get better test performance because you maybe, uh, even though you shouldn't, but you maybe applied it multiple times to the test set. And at some point, yeah, it's just um, performing well there. But I think, you know, I would, yeah, it's like the recommendation, I would say uh, XGBus is still a solid baseline and it probably performs um, better across different data sets, in my opinion, because it's probably also easier to get it right, where with deep learning, I feel like it's always more finicky. You can get good performance, but yeah, you have to be more careful where I think other methods are a bit more forgiving or robust. I would even say uh, random forests are still my favorite baseline because you don't need any tuning. You can just, uh, you know, use thousand decision trees as one hyperparameter and see how it performs. And it usually, I mean, it's maybe never the best method, but it's also uh, not never the worst in terms of it always will perform pretty solid, uh, even though you don't tune it. Whereas, yeah, you have to have then 
more time and uh, experience with other methods to really make them work well. And yeah, I honestly think XGBoost is still a good solid baseline. The only issue with it is it's boring and people don't like to use it because it's, you know, it's boring. So um, yeah. Thank you. And sorry, I should also say it's boring, not because the technique is not fascinating. It's more bore. It's more meant because it's been around for such a long time, right? It's like, um, you know, it's old hat almost like people seen it a lot of times and yeah. Uh, hi, a quick question if I may. Oh yeah, sure. All right, so uh, my name is Ahmed. I work in the NLP space and uh, actually I have a couple of questions. So the first one is uh, a question about terminology, the encoder decoder terminology. Uh, maybe it's an opportunity for me to understand something that I was missing, but my current understanding is the architectures are exactly the same. Uh, the only difference is in the training objectives. So I was wondering, uh, as you see these different aliases, you see causal language model, you see masked language model, demonizing uh, language model. So why didn't we name them a causal transformer or autoregressive or mask transformer or demonizing transformer? I mean, in my understanding, that would be more informative uh, in terms of what they're actually trained on. Now, if I say encoder and decoder, it doesn't actually inform me about the architecture because it's the same. Um, am I missing something? Yeah, I would say that's a good point. I think um, they are uh, based on the same um, backbone in a sense that it is both um, multi-head self-attention. Uh, I, I would say the details are a bit different where yeah, for the encoder, you don't have any the of the masking. The I mean, yeah, you have masks in the inputs, but you don't have this causal attention uh, which you have in the decoder. Um, I, it's a good question. I think, um, I mean, encoder, decoder is one way to think about it. The other way you could also call them maybe autoencoder. So instead of saying encoder, you can say it's more like an autoencoder uh, where you are encoding the input into some representation where you always have the whole input essentially. That, that I think, I mean, except for the mask to tokens, it's essentially, you know, like a masked autoencoder in a sense where in mask autocoders and in, in images, you mask pixels, but you still have the whole input. Whereas then for the decoder, it's more like autoregressive, where you, it's like a procedure, you do one at a time, you, you complete the sentence or the text. And uh, yeah, yeah, they are very similar, I would say, in terms of both use multi head attention, except the decoder has this uh, causal atten causal attention mask but yeah uh, it's it's just the terminology i guess um yeah right. all right thank you very much so if i understand correctly it's really just the format of the input whether you're masking randomly or just masking the past tokens and i suppose the training objective That's yeah yeah also for i would say for the um decoder one yeah the model gets different inputs like when you are training it you have let's say uh, one token two tokens three tokens and it always predicts the next token so in a sense it's more yeah there's more masking happening there like it's so you can also think of it as a unidirectional it goes from left to right whereas for the encoder it's uh, some people call it bidirectional but you know it's not going from both sides it's just like you you get always the same the same chunk though but there are things missing in the middle but yeah it's always it's more like fixed length i mean uh if you consider the masks and the causal uh, attention mechanism it's in a sense also the same context length in the decoder but the meaning the non-masked tokens they vary so there's more var uh, variation in the input lengths in in that sense and I, honestly it sounds like it's a yeah it's a small difference and it is i think a small difference but um in practice i think it makes a larger difference where with these encoders you would have to do something on top of it to to do a task so i i would say yeah you need to have you can't just say complete the sentence you know if you start an email and you say finish my email i don't think uh encoder would be able to do that so i think the terminology is more 
meant for specifying when to use that model, where the encoder would tell me, okay, this is a model where I just encode my inputs, and then I have to worry about what I do with my inputs. Maybe I want to train a classifier. Maybe I want to do, I don't know, like a topic, yeah, or, yeah, topic classification. Or I think it can also do other things, like summarization in a way, but there's always the fixed um, element to it, where with the autoregressive model, it's, you know, you, you can do few shot, uh, few shot learning and stuff like that. And I think it's just, the use case is just different, I would say. But yeah, that's a good question. It's not fundamentally different, though. You're right. Okay, yeah. thank you. I have a final question, but I'll let someone else, uh, else uh, ask a question. Maybe you will come back to me later. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we're actually out of time. Oh. Uh, if anyone has one final question, please feel free to ask. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Oh yeah, yeah. we can hear you perfectly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, sorry, uh, because I'm using my phone, yeah. Um, uh, I have a question about uh, some pruning or quantization techniques to use to, to train LLMs. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe, yeah just like the traditional used uh, for convolutional neural networks. Is there, is there a way, can we do it to LLMs? Um, I honestly, I don't have much experience with pruning. Um, never implemented that myself, uh, besides you know knowing about the concepts. But yeah, for quantization, I think right now the hottest uh, library is the bits and bytes library, which has a lot of quantization methods. I think there's 8-bit, 4-bit, uh, different versions of that. And we have some techniques of that also in this LitGPT repository that I mentioned that you can just apply for inference. Um, I must say, in my experience, I, I think it depends on which version of the library you are using in the beginning. I think it was slower, actually. So what you get mostly out of it is um, memory savings. You save a lot of compute memory, but there is an additional computation cost because I think yeah, due to the con uh, conversion from floats to integers, there is just ex uh, extra computation happening, which made it a bit slower. But I think in the recent libraries, I would have to double check it's i think also even faster inference is faster and saves you memory and you almost i mean ideally get the same outputs so the quality is still the same but yeah that is uh, i have not done any research on that really so that is um to the extent i know it and um i am i would say not an expert in quantization methods but uh, i'm happy to share some re uh, references later but yeah that is to the extent of my knowledge what i can say in a nutshell here Awesome. Thank you so much, Sebastian, for the wonderful conversation we have today. I feel like I've learned so much. Yeah, and uh, thanks again for yeah reading my book. I'm really flattered. It was nice. Um, interesting, uh, very technical question. So I had a good time. I, I like, you know, talking about technical things. So I enjoyed being here. And yeah, thanks for all the questions. And, you know, um, you, you know where to find me. So if you have additional questions, don't feel free, uh, uh, feel free to reach out or ask. And, you know, um, maybe there will be a second volume one day. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Yeah, for our viewers online later, please feel free to please, please be sure to pick up a copy of this amazing book. I highly recommend it. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for tuning in and happy reading, everyone. Bye. Yep, and have a good weekend, everyone. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks. Man.